Thank you. <laughs> Can you hear me? Yeah. All right. Hi, everyone. Thanks that you all joined me here. I'm, I'm Zach. Zacharias Reinhardt, uh, but I think this is a bit complicated, so call me, call me just Zach if you like. And uh, this time I want to show you some sculpting stuff. Mm. I'm a freelance artist, uh, I also do some Blender training, and I just love sculpting. And over the past years I practiced sculpting a lot, and I think I will just show you some, some things that I learned in the past few years. So, but before I start, I want to show you a short teaser I was working on in the last couple of days. It's basically about a product I'm working on. It's somehow related to sculpting. And let's show this first. And... Thanks a lot. Yeah, this is a product I'm working on for almost a year now, so I hope everything will work right uh, so that I can publish this in December. And I have to say a huge thank you to Render Street, I don't know, Marius. Thanks a lot because they made it possible that I can render this whole thing in just uh, one day I have left. So a lot, a huge thank you. Okay. Well, this is an advanced uh, sculpting uh, workshop, but still I want to show you how I learn sculpting, because I think it's important for all of the people that um, do not know how to sculpt. So, I have these little sheets here. So, this is basically my, 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 my way on how I learn sculpting. So, Certainly important is to just learn the fundamentals, to, to get to know the, the tools, what you are using there, no matter what tools you are using. In my case, certainly Blender. And I find it pretty useful if you start sculpting, start with very simple um, fantasy uh, creatures or characters, because there you don't need to take much care about uh, anatomy or something like this. And then, Certainly, practice is a very important part of sculpting. I will talk about that in a second. After you practice for a while, certainly you should improve your workflows. Over the years, every year, I, I learn new stuff, and it's pretty helpful after you have some experience to just watch professional sculpting and time lapses. So if you're a beginner watching time lapses and have no idea what they are doing there, I guess it's more important if you have more experience, then the time lapses are very helpful. Then improve your efficiency, and there I want to uh, draw some attention on Sculpt January, which is a project I started with a friend, Manuel, over there. And this is basically the, the thing that gets me going. So let me show you some stuff here. 2014, Manuel came to me and asked me, hey, should we do a challenge in January, just do one sculpting every day? And I thought, well, it's a cool idea, it sounds challenging, and I just wanted to learn sculpting really bad. And then we just started, um, sculpt January. I thought, well, not just not do it alone, just um, make a Facebook group and invite other people to join. 
And so Skype January was born, and yeah, I, I did it twice completely, and in 2017 I did like 12, because I just wanted to improve the quality a bit. So to see how I improved over the years, I just show you what I did. This is 2015, where we started the whole thing. So down there, we, for, every, for every day in the whole month, we pick a topic and down below you can see the topic and how much time I needed for the sculptings. And yeah, it's basically where I really started sculpting. It's not the best stuff, but I learned a lot, really a lot. So, and there I also try to make it pretty fast, so most of the things are really rough and uh, not pretty polished. And it was a very hard challenge to do it every day, besides your job and family life and all this stuff. So sometimes I just worked until late at night to get this done. But pushing you through there and uh, really finishing everything helps a lot. <clears throat> So, I just skip through here a bit. So this just should give you an idea how I started. Then in 2016, I also finished the whole month. After one month of sculpting, you are super tired of sculpting and doesn't touch it for the next few months. But I think you can see that in the next year, I improved quite a bit. And also the sculpting time got shorter. By the way, the videos you also can watch online, just Google for Sculpt January. So, and 2017, as mentioned, I did not all the 31 sculpting, but a few of them. And also I challenged myself to shade the sculptings in a very specific way. Here you can see some of them. Some are my own creations, some are um, used concept art for, from ArtStation, or this one here is by David Revoir. I had a baby at this, uh, I still have a baby, but <laughs> that's the reason why I did something like this. <laughs> yeah, and this one was the last sculpting I did for Skype January, and this one was the first I did in 2015. And I guess you can see there's a little bit of improvement in there. <laughs> so I really recommend you, if you want to learn sculpting, then go ahead and practice in Sculpt January. So certainly next January 2018, we will have another Sculpt January. You can find it um, on my website. Just Basically, just Google for Sculpt January and you will find it. Well, the internet is slow, I guess. And also on Facebook, there's this Skype January group where the most action takes place, but you still can um, participate if you are not on Facebook. So you don't have to be on Facebook. All right, let's go over to the actual sculpting process. Certainly, before we start, we should prepare ourselves. One important thing, um, some of the things you just do once, it's um, set up the graphics tablet. So I just will switch between the slide and what I'm doing here. So just search for the Wacom settings. It's in German here, sorry for that, but uh, I just explain what I set up here. Because uh, if you think on Blender, you always navigate with the mouse wheel by clicking the mouse wheel to change uh, the viewport angle and so on. And if you just have the standard settings of the pen, it doesn't work. So you have to switch mouse and pen, and this is not really useful. So what I like to do is to set the lower button of this pen to the middle mouse click. So it's basically clicking this button here and the upper to the right click. So sometimes you have to do a right click. And the other thing I do is to switch from this hover click to this click and tap. I think it's your personal preference. I really like this click and tap. That means I have to click the button and just when I hit the, the graphics tablet, then this button will affect so in, in this way, I can easily navigate in Blender by just... So I just have to check if everything is right here. Because I just want to have one screen, not two. So, okay. 
So this you can also change. So now I just click the middle mouse button and when I'm drawing on the tablet, basically I can rotate the view. While holding down shift, I can move this around and with control I can zoom in and out. And this is pretty easy and now I just can control my whole viewport with only the pen and the keyboard. So then the other thing, let's close this one. The other thing I have here is enable rotate around selection. I mean, this is in general a cool thing. I have this always on, but especially for sculpting, this is also um, pretty helpful because if I switch to sculpt mode and enable dynamic topology, I will tell about this a little bit later. And if I now sculpt somewhere here and make changes, the, the view will lock this place where I sculpted and then I can rotate around this specific spot. So when I sculpt here, it will around this area. When I sculpt here, this will rotate around this area. And this is extremely helpful because if you have this off, it can be pretty annoying to control where you are. If you sculpt here and then the camera is rotating in a completely different direction, you always have to move your view around. So I really recommend enabling this one. So then install the Sculpt Tools add-on. This contains basically tools which you have in Blender already, but just in one place, so you can access them a bit quicker. This is an external add-on. You have to download them. Just Google Sculpt Tools add-on for Blender. If you don't want to do this, you also can enable the Bool Tools and the Modifier Tools, which allows you to do the main things I do with the Sculpt Tools add-on as well. So you can find it over here. It's, in actual fact, nothing really you do in sculpt mode. It's more like using Boolean operations for merging objects or remeshing the objects quickly or apply all the modifiers from all the selected objects. But as mentioned, you also can do this with the bool tools. I have this enabled already. You can find it over here, I guess. It also has this um, Boolean operations to quickly add Boolean modifiers and so on. It's much faster than go in here, add Boolean modifier and so on. And then we have this modifier tools. You can find it here, which basically allows you, if you have modifiers on here, to apply all modifiers from all se selected objects and so on. So why we need this, I will show you in a second. Then enable matcaps or quick preferences. Matcaps we can find here in the property in yeah, properties panel under shading. We can enable the matcaps. Let's quickly collapse this. And these are basically some kind of shading which will lie above the whole scene, and you can choose between different shading modes. And this just helps you to to understand the shape of the thing you are sculpting even better. Um, but I read somewhere online that this also takes a bit of performance. I don't know how much this really um, in affects, but there's also this quick preferences add-on, which you can download for free. There you can basically uh, change the, the um, solid shading lighting. And there are some presets, and I als always use this dark gray, adjust this a bit, because here you really good can see uh, the edges of the object, and there you can read the, the shape of your objects pretty well. So this makes this even easier to sculpt on. And yeah, one other thing is entering autographic view. I find it really hard if you are with NumPad 5. Let, let me enable the shortcuts here. So if you are in a perspective view, it's pretty hard to sculpt in this area and then back here, so you don't know the relation between the, the proportions you're sculpting here. So and if you're entering um, autographic view with NumPad 5, it's, it's much better to see it. It's just something I experienced, so I, it's hard to describe this in a proper way. But yeah, just try it out for yourself. Certainly in some areas, if you're sculpting a character and uh, want to sculpt under the arm, for example, you have to switch to perspective view from time to time. But in most cases, this is pretty helpful. And the last thing I do is also on the list here, enable only render. That means if you 
under display, click on only render, all the grid, the helping objects and so on will be disabled and you just have uh, the object itself. And for sculpting itself, you just basically need the 3D viewport and the tool shelf sometimes, and then you can sculpt. And there's also a little trick. If you, for example, press Alt F11, you have this windowless uh, full screen mode. And if you press Alt and F10, in addition, you have this full, um, full screen mode from the 3D view. And now you can easily sculpt without any distractions. So to, um, to get back to the original view, you press Alt F10 again, or up in this corner, you can click this button here. So these are the basic things I do to prepare for sculpting. So let's go on here. Sculpting workflow, okay. So. So over the years, I um, developed my sculpting workflow, or maybe I just uh, steal from other artists I don't remember anymore. But I mean, some of the things are certain for any um, 3D projects, like using references or concepts, depending on what you want to sculpt. It's always super important. Then building up a solid base mesh, this is what I used to do. That means some people are just starting with a sphere and dragging all the forms out of it, but I like to prepare uh, the base mesh, I will show you this. And what I also see a lot of beginners doing wrong, I would say, is start with a very high resolution. So if you start with a very high resolution and sculpt over it, it's just a pain, and um, I can clearly understand why people stop sculpting then. So in actual fact, you can create pretty awesome um, shapes already with a very low resolution. So this is um, interesting. So let's get the first things first. I want to show you on this example here. This was from Skype January 2017. Um, how I basically did that. This is 100% dynamic topology, so I did not retopo this or texture paint this. This is 100% dentopo and 100% procedural shaders on this. So I used this nice concept art from um, Sergei Vasnev, if I pronounce his name right. I found this on ArtStation. And I really like this. Uh, the topic was turtle, so I don't want to sculpt this uh, typical turtle. And that's where I started. So I hope Blender will open up fast. Yeah. Okay, this is the base mesh I created. And for creating base meshes, I use very simple shapes. You can see this one here is in actual fact just a cube with some extrusions and a subsurf modifier on this. So basically you just add a cube, put a subsurf modifier on this, and then in edit mode, depending or according to your um, uh, concept art, you start building the shape just by extruding, scaling, and moving the stuff around. So and I used to um, do all the parts, like the limbs, and in this case, the head and the neck here, as separate objects, as you can see. This is all separate, also all the fingers here, because we will join them afterwards. So if I, for example, want to add a head here, I would add, for example, another cube, put a subsurf modifier on this, then shape this a bit, for example, whatever we wanted to create. And in this way, I create the basic shapes here. And you can use everything for creating your um, base meshes. For example, you can use curves if you like, because also curves you can convert to mesh ob objects. At the end, you need mesh objects. You have a basic curve, and in the curve settings, for example, we can set the fill method to full, and then increase the depth here and the resolution. And with Alt-S, I can scale these um, dots here. And this way, you can add tentacles, uh, tails, or whatever. And when you're done with all this, you can convert this with Alt-C and convert this to a mesh. And now this is a mesh object, and you can use this for sculpting. The same way, I um, can use the skin modifier, for example. I did this 
here, you can see I'm only editing an edge here. Let me turn off the modifiers. So this is what I have in the edit mode in actual fact. Then I add a mirror to mirror this to the other side, a skin modifier which is creating the mesh around one edge and the subsurf modifier to make it a bit rounder. Same thing I used for the fingers, as you can see. So it's pretty easy to just quickly build up some mm. meshes. So you might ask yourself, why don't you use a skin modifier for everything? Because the skin modifier was built to create base meshes for sculpting. But um, if you are extruding a lot of things, it might happen that you get these glitches here. And if you then start sculpting and have these weird glitches, then you will have some bad errors in there and need to solve them later. And this is not really fun. So I used to separate everything from each other. So certainly if you want to do the fingers, you just copy the arms, go in edit mode, quickly adjust this stuff. So it also works pretty fast. So and how can I start sculpting now on this? We now, I usually do not join everything now because for example, if I start with a very low resolution on sculpting and sculpt over the fingers, then I totally destroy the fingers. So I usually just um, combine all the bigger parts from what I'm sculpting here, like the arms and the body. But right now we can't do this because we have all these modifiers on. And there we use this Sculpt Tools add-on. And here I just can select everything and click on Apply Mods. But first, I want to increase the resolution so that every object has about the same resolution. So, like this. Select everything, apply mods. And now from all the objects, the modifiers are applied, as you can see. So now, we need to join these things, but not with Control J, this uh, typical joining operation. It needs to be um, united with the Boolean operation. So I click on this union. You can also use a Boolean modifier or the bool tools as mentioned. And now if I fly inside this object, you can see <coughs> that we really have a hole in there. So both things are an actual fact connected with each other. So now we can switch over to sculpt mode. <coughs> Let's quickly enable quick pref with a dark Okay, I think that's fine. Okay, in sculpt mode, when I start sculpting, I certainly enable dynamic topology. You also can do it with Control D if you like. And I recommend to switch the detail type method to constant detail, because otherwise you will have a different level of details according how close you are zooming into your object. And now we have this fixed resolution slider. This is a divider for one blender unit. So the bigger the number here, the bigger the resolution is. With this eyedropper, you can click on your object and get the resolution from this specific um, edge you're clicking on. So usually I go a bit higher than this. This is the basic settings I have here in uh, sculpt mode. And also I always start to sculpt symmetrically if possible, because you will save a lot of time if in the first few detail rounds uh, you just have a symmetric object. So as you can see, I just have the standard brushes. In 99% of the cases, I just use the standard brushes and in actual fact, just a few of them. The, my main tool is a clay stripes um, brush. I think a lot of other artists will agree on that. And yeah, we have some basic settings here, like the radius, the strengths, and so on. I don't want to cover all this because uh, this is more like a beginner topic. We can change the resolution in viewport with, by pressing F, or with Control F, I can also, sorry, Shift F, I can control the strengths. So in actual fact, I did not really need this thing here. Also, all the brushes I can access through shortcuts. For example, if I press one, two, three, four, and so on, as you can see up there, I can change um, the brushes. And on my website, I also have this sculpting sheet sheet. So if you want to have a sheet sheet with all the sculpting brushes, you can find it there. So and now, basically, 
if I just use the smooth brush, I now want to smooth the transition between these two objects and go over here. This, in actual fact, works quite well. <laughs> but what I wanted to show you is sometimes you just need to add some details there because the smooth brush is not adding details. So I have to go over here. If I zoom in here, you can see that I'm adding details by sculpting over here, depending on the resolution you set here. And in this way, I can quickly smooth this area. And in just a second, it looks like these two objects are, in actual fact, belonging to each other. So smooth over it. And in this way, I can quickly add some details. I'm not an anatomy expert, so I use references. I have this anatomy figure from 3dtotal.com, which is pretty helpful because you can touch it and turn it around and see how all this is interacting with each other. So I really would recommend this. And then we just use the basic brushes. I also use a crease brush a lot to define the major shapes. And you can see the resolution is pretty low at the moment. And I just would start to define the basic shapes. With holding down control, I can take geometry away, basically. With normal left click, I can add geometry. And in this way, I just start to define the basic shapes. After a certain point, when I'm fine with this, I just take the next one and add it to my mesh using the sculpt tools union, and then I can go on. Sometimes you can see that uh, Duntopo is disabled, so you have to enable this again. And now, as you can see, I quickly smooth this area. And now the legs are also belonging to the body. So now I want to skip this a bit. All these iterations here are the original iterations. So you can see what I did here. Here you can see I added the arms to the body and sculpted some shapes. And also you have to keep in mind that if you're looking at the concept art, that most of the body is covered with this armor thing. So certainly we don't need to sculpt everything in detail from the body. Then let's go on with... Oh, sorry. Third one. Yeah, you can see here I also added the head and the neck to the body and uh, sculpted even more details. I think a detail level like this would totally be fine for the body itself, if some claws are over it. Then you can see I added the legs and sculpted even more. You can see the detail level is a bit higher. So I would recommend not just going higher and lower with the detail level, just at a certain point where you realize that you can't go higher with a certain detail level you have, then you uh, increase the details a bit and then go in the next detail level. And if you're fine with this, go a bit higher and at the next detail level. So, and as mentioned, try to keep as low with the details as long as possible. Because unfortunately, Blender can't handle that much polygons that good. So since I know from the beginning that I wanted to sculpt this specific concept art and also in the same angle, at a certain point I added the camera for this perspective. And certainly the creature has not a symmetrical pose, so I started to pose this creature. So I had the main details also for the arms on both sides, so I don't need to sculpt them on both sides separately. And then I just added an armature system, so very basic stuff here. And now I can rotate the arm like I needed. Same thing I did for the other arm. And as you can see, at this stage, I did not add uh, the fingers here because the fingers are a bit different on both hands. So I did not sculpt them in this stage. Ah, and one important thing, certainly, if you have posed your creature, every time you add an armature system, there will be also an armature modifier added. So you have to apply this to go on with dynamic topology sculpting. Otherwise, you get some weird glitches there. So <laughs> so 
So here I added this armor thing. Let's quickly take a look in the modifiers here. <laughs> this is the base mesh, basically. So mirror modifier on this, subsurf modifier, solidify modifier to make it thick, and another subsurf to smooth this a bit. So as you can see, I did not take much time to create the, the base meshes. And all these details on there, you can put a lot of objects there, but I just sculpted them using the, the crease brush and the clay stripes brush mainly. Also, you can see here I increased the res resolution a bit. So basically what I did is adding some shapes here, then go in with the crease brush, you can see here, and add these lines. And in this way, you can quickly yeah, add these kind of shapes. So it's super basic stuff I used here. And also, all these things, I guess it doesn't even make sense, but it looks like this on the concept art, and it was fine to me in this case. So this is also, I'm not sure, was this symmetry sculpting? I guess here not. Let's go a little bit on here. Yeah, you can see here is the pose much more clear. Also, I added more details to the legs, I guess. Then the wooden stick I also added in the previous version. And here you can see I adjusted my base mesh fingers. So it's always possible to add base meshes or objects to your object or remove something. For example, if you realize that the neck is completely not what you want. You can, for example, quickly add an object here, select both, and then also in the Sculpt Tools add-on or Bool Tools, you can use a difference option to cut this off. And then you can add other objects there if you like, or just sculpt over this. Let's check the, the topo here. Sculpt over this and clear this area if you like. So just smoothing, add a little bit of details, and now he has no head anymore. <laughs> so what I try to tell you is um, sculpting is a very creative process, so not f the first uh, way you sculpt this will be perfect, so it's always nice to change things, and I also recommend not using undo, just try to cut something off, put something else there, and start to sculpt over it like you would do it in real life. So I think here was not much change. Let's see some progress here. So yeah, now is the fun part. Here I sculpted uh, the back thing here, and let's turn this around. And certainly also down here, I know that this thing will also just be viewed from one specific angle and certainly I don't want to put much uh, more time in it than needed. So I just sculpted the stuff that we can actually see from one side. On the final model, you will see this even more. So basically now it's just adding more and more details, going higher with the detail level. Here you can see, I think this is nearly the final thing. You can see I also added some very simple eyes. I also would recommend never put the eyes into the mesh itself, joining this, because it will be very hard to sculpt around the so eyelids and so on, because then they are merging with the eyes and you get some weird eye shapes. And yeah, also here, if I turn it around, you can see it's two-faced. <laughs> yeah. So what's still missing here is the details for this wooden stick but you also can see the hands were sculpted, and I also added other stuff, like here. And at some point, if we take a look under his armor, it's looking like this. So I wanted to add some more details to the arm, and if you have this big creature and sculpt super high details, it can be quite slow at some point. So in this case, it was lucky because the whole body is covered with the armor, and I just cut everything off. And then if you sculpt on one object alone and add more details, this is much um, quicker or smoother than if you have the whole body and sculpt on this thing. So I just cut everything off. And then this way, it was much easier to sculpt the whole thing. 
So I guess let's jump a little bit further here. So this was a final model. You can see I added some details here. These are just basically just a few strokes with a crease brush over here and a few strokes with a clay stripes brush. So in 99% of the cases, I just use these two brushes. <laughs> and for adding holes, for example, I use the blob brush. So we can let's use a different curve here. Just um, subtract by holding down control and I should increase the resolution, but you can see that I can easily create holes, and I use this for the eye holes, to add the eyes there, and if I need to create other holes. So, and let's finally check the final model here. Oh, sorry. So, and this is what we have here. I added some basic light setup, the camera certainly, and the ground. And as you can see, even in the final shot, I did not sculpt the rest on the other side. And let's see how much time we will have left, but everything, all the shading, as mentioned, is procedural generated. I hope I can show you s some little things of this. So let's take a look here. As you can see, I used a reference. I created a solid base mesh. I used a very low resolution from start on. Then I used to keep everything separated, especially the smaller things like the fingers and so on. Then I increase the resolution in steps. After I have a certain resolution done, then I increase it, not every time, up and down. And here's a little trick I found out um, not that long ago. If you want to add this very high level, like using textures, texture brushes to add, for example, skin, details that you can flood fill the whole mesh. That means the whole mesh will have one resolution. Then you turn off dynamic topology, and then you can, in actual fact, um, sculpt quite smoothly. So let me show you this. Then it's even possible to have millions of polygons. So that means in the standard sculpting settings, so you don't need an add-on for this, with dynamic topology, you have this detail flat fill. If you click on this, this detail size you have here will be filled the whole mesh, so everything has a, the same resolution then. But I have to increase this a bit. Let me check this. This is 50, okay, let's double this. And let's hit the button. Certainly, this can take a short while. So let's check this. You can see also from the outside, it does not really show up, but it has a quite high resolution now. And I think I should increase this even more so that it starts lagging here. <laughs> but this can take some time. <laughs> so anyway, if this takes too long, I will uh, stop this, but um, it's pretty cool because after this you can turn off dynamic topology, you have a even subdivision everywhere, and then you can pretty easy and smooth sculpt all the details on this stuff. So, okay, you can see it now start lagging, so let's disable the topo, and I hope I don't tell shit here. So, and now you can see it's pretty smooth. So compared to the other before, it's pretty nice. Certainly you will have much more polygons than before, but you also have much more details. <coughs> okay, let's go on to another topic, which I want to cover, solving problems. Everyone has sculpting problems. <laughs> so here are some, some things I used to do if I have some problems. Um, yeah, if you know Blender, then you probably know Apply Scale. I also gave some uh, sculpting workshops in Germany, and there was this one guy who did this very special thing. I have no idea how he did this, but you can scale your objects in object mode. Like, 
something like this. Now you can see the Z scale factor is at 30, and then somehow in edit mode, he scaled it down probably, so that it has a normal shape again. But you can see the scaling factor in, uh, for the Z direction is still 30, so if I now switch to, we even get a warning up here that we have a non-uniform scale. And if I now start sculpting here, let's enable this, this, let's increase this a bit, like 20, and let's use a standard sculpt brush. If I now sculpt on this, you can see this weird thing is happening, like it's scaling in this certain direction. So, and if something like this happens, undo this and then press Control A and apply the scale. So you can see now this is back at one. Uh, we have a uniform scale again. And if I now scale, sculpt on here, everything looks fine again. So next thing is make normals consistent. This is as especially if you want to join certain things with, um, with the bool tools or the sculpting tools. And one object has a negative scale, for example. Like sometimes you mirror objects by scaling this by a negative one. So you have a negative scale. And sometimes if you then apply the scaling, you can see the normals are switching. This we can see by this strange color this thing has. And if we do not do this, so the scale is still negative, and we pull tool this. Um, sorry, not speed sculpt. Speed sculpt is, by the way, another cool sculpting add on which is paid. It costs 10 euros. You can find it online, which is also pretty helpful. I can really recommend. So, and in this case, <laughs> nothing happens. So, Blender improved, that's nice. But before it was like this, then the two objects are not joining. It's like uh, the difference option taking stuff away. So in actual fact, I tried this yesterday and I had no errors. So good for us, less problems. So, but anyway, if you have ever problems with the normals, it's pretty easy to solve this. Basically, you always can see it that your object has this very strange color, let's add a, something like this here. In this case, the normals are flipped. That means uh, the wrong face, uh, the wrong side of the face is showing up. Just switch to edit mode, select everything, and press Control N. Then this will be solved in most of the cases. So we move doubles. This is also nice. If you, for example, it also happened to me once. If you have an object and accidentally duplicate this in edit mode, so you have basically two objects on the same spot. While sculpting, you did not really notice this, so it still works, but I should apply the modifier. So if I now sculpt here, it looks pretty nice. But if you then, again, join objects with a Boolean operation, then it can cause some bad troubles. So in actual fact, you then, if we take a look in here, two vertices are lying on each other. Select everything, and down here you have this remove doubles. So all the vertices which are on the same spot will be joined. You can see quite a lot were removed. And then you can sculpt and join objects again pretty easily. Sometimes, for example, if you already sculpted a lot on here and now want to add some other parts and didn't realize this, um, then it's not, sometimes not possible to do this remove um, doubles because um, the vertices are shifting away from each other. Then it's nice to make a quick remesh. For this, you can either use the Sculpt Tools add-on with this remesh option, or you do a quick remesh with the remesh modifier, which is basically the same thing, just here you can access this a bit quicker, just increase the resolution, not too high, click on remesh, then the whole thing will be rebuilt with a new shape or a new, new geometry, um, but these strange overlapping things will be removed as well. So if you ever have problems joining objects together, this is really one little trick which can help you just remeshing the object. 
And if you don't like the Remesh algorithm from uh, the Remesh modifier, I can recommend you this tool, Instant Meshes, which is also for free. It's super easy to use which allows you to quickly remesh your objects with a beautiful um, uh, yeah, topology, basically. So there you have even better. Okay. Time is running fast. Here you can see it as well. Um, yeah, and one thing I also want to show you is transferring details to the multi-resolution modifier. Imagine you have a very high resolution of your model and want to work with this somehow. And your viewport is just lagging around and is not taking much fun anymore. So you can use this trick either for if you want to create a quality, high quality production ready characters, or if you want to just quickly have basically levels you can turn on and off for your, for your object. So here we have an example. This here is a dynamic topology sculpting, as you can see, I did. Don't ask me what this thing is. This thing here is a complete retopo of this. I did this manually because I wanted to animate this character, but certainly you can just use a remesh modifier or this instant meshes tool to just quickly build a very simple uh, retopology object. So this thing here has 5,000 faces, not much, and uh, I don't want to click, but you can see it's it's a lot. I don't want to enter edit mode now because Blender probably crash. What we now can do is to add the multi-res modifier. Let's do this from scratch. Let's add the multi-res modifier, which is similar to the subsurf modifier. We can now subdivide the mesh a few times, and you will see that this looks similar if we add a subsurf modifier. Then I will add the shrink wrap modifier, and here we can choose a target object. So in this case, it's a high poly object. So let's choose this. And now you can see that all the faces from our low resolution object will be projected on the high resolution object. You can see we have some glitches in here because my Retopo object also has a mouse hole in there. Let's discover the alien from inside. So and certainly this will also be projected on our mesh. But I, in edit mode, I just created a vertex group for the mouse area, for the inner mouse area. And in the shrink wrap modifier, we can exclude this area if we like. So the shrink wrap will not apply on the inner part of this alien. So now comes the cool part. You can do a few adjustments here, but you can see it already works quite well, if it's doing something. Please. Okay. I just open this again. So, okay. Here yeah, I've set up everything as you can see. And if I now apply the shrink wrap modifier, let's do this quickly, you can see it's still there. So all this information from the shrink web modifier now are stored inside the multi res modifier. That means if you have a other um, order in the modifier stack, this will not work. So the shrink web modifier has to be below the multi res modifier. And now the cool thing, I can basically change the levels of subdivisions here and still have everything. So for example, if we now want to rig this, uh, texture this, animate this, we just disable the multi res modifier. We can do all this stuff and then we enable this again. Also, if you just want to create the static uh, sculpting, you can use the same trick. You can add some quick armatures, just pose your lowest object here. For example, if I just go into edit mode, which is not really possible in, in this high resolution sculptings, I now can pose this pretty simple. And you will see that all the details from this multi res modifier are still there. So nothing will be lost here. The only thing that you can't do is to add new geometry to the mesh inside. So if I now add some loop cuts here or just extrude something, this will certainly break the whole thing. Then you have to do it again. But another cool thing, if you find out that on some areas this maybe not looks that nice, you still can add it, uh, add, enter, sorry. You still can enter 
um, the sculpt mode, and multi-rest modifier was created for sculpting. You certainly can still sculpt on the mo multi-rest modifier information. So if you like, you can also add more information here, change this, also subdivide this even higher to add even more details to the sculpting, if you like. And this is working pretty well. Yeah, four minutes left. So I will probably not go to the live session. <laughs> OK, just a few words about shading. So sometimes you just want to create this uh, sculpting and want to present it in a nice way. You don't want to animate this. So it's nice to quickly shade this without creating UV maps and so on. And in this way, we can use procedural textures or seamless textures and the box mapping. Also, we can use vertex painting. That means we are painting on the geometry itself, not on a texture in actual fact. And uh, we can mix a lot of stuff. Let's quickly take a look in this one here. The cat. So quickly, all this stuff here. This one here is 100% procedural. No external textures used. Here I only used uh, a paper's texture for the diapers here and a skin texture for um, the, the skin. This is 100% procedural. This is also nearly 100% only the skin. There I added a seamless texture, but the rest is procedural. And this one here is 100% procedural. So I think you can get quite nice details there. Yeah? So let's quickly jump into this. this. Okay, just quickly. So, as you can see, the node setup is not that complicated. Let's quickly take a look here. So, and here you can see what I mean with mix, mix, mix. I have a lot of these mix RGB nodes. And I'm basically mixing different um, procedural textures together. Here, up here, we have this geometry node with a pointiness feature, which you can plug into a color ramp and then um, highlight some features of this creature. This I use as mixing mask for this um, mix RGB node. So I mix two colors. That means one color will show up on the white areas and one color on the black areas. So let's take a look in this. I can change the colors if I like. To green, for example. So I easily can add a little bit of details. Then this attribute node you can add and type in the vertex color information here. So I went over to the um, vertex paint mode and just painted something on the, on the model, in this case the nose, because the nose should have a different color in this case. And this is basically also a black and white mask I used to mix with this color here, now it's green, but it should not be something like this, and a new color for the nose, basically. I can also change this if I like. Then I added with this object coordinate nodes, this object output, I used for the standard noise texture, which is, ba which is basically just this uh, colorful noise. I created two of them, one with small details, one with big details. Then I put this into a color ramp, then it will be black and white, and I can control the contrast, basically, as you can see here. And this, again, is also black and white. I used, again, as a mix mask for another node here to add just a little bit of uh, color variation in the skin. Also, this stuff here, same thing. If you, we tweak this color ramp, we can see we just have a few dots left. I also mixed them into the whole thing. If I zoom in, you can see it. And the other stuff you can ignore. Just put the principal shader in there or something <laughs> like this. <laughs> I have not much a plan of um, PBR shading, so I put just something quickly together so it looks somehow nice. I mixed the subsurf scattering shader in there. And as you can see, now we have this quick shading, and it looks kind of interesting. Also, the golden stuff here, it's even simpler, I guess. This is the golden material. And let me show you this again quickly. Yeah. Also, this one is just a glass shader and a diffuse shader for the eyes. Pretty simple. 
I think what makes this look so cool is by having a, a, a rim light, so just an area light in the back and one light in the side, so you have this nice lighting. So lighting is one of the most important things to present your objects well, but I guess there you can ask people like Lab, they will show you some nice tricks. Yeah. Certainly, what, uh, one other thing I want to mention, I can show you this on this example here. Here I added um, a roughness map, which is also basically a very simple um, noise texture. And with this value, you can control the roughness, so on some spots it looks rougher. In this case, like water is dropping on him. So you get this subtle realism effect pretty quickly. So, and in this case, I just show you the model, not much more, because time is over. So yeah, here it's pretty slow, but you can see he also has color in some areas, and this was painted in vertex paint mode. And Julian Casper, a nice sculptor, by the way, um, just mentioned that in the latest Blender 2.79 build, the vertex paint mode was highly improved. And I just tested it because before it was unusable, basically, but now it's pretty cool. You don't have these glitches if you paint over an edge, for example. So definitely check out the latest build and test the vertex paint mode. Yeah. I think I could talk on and on and on. So I just, uh, if I had time, I just want to sculpt this little, one of these little characters from Lalander Hushuka. <laughs> it's an artist you find on ArtStation. But yeah, we don't have any time anymore, but I saw it this way. So if you want to learn sculpting, join Sculpt January. Also, we have this weekly CG challenge, which is basically not sculpting only. Uh, you can join every two weeks. We have a new challenge with great uh, prizes and sponsors. So definitely check this out. And yeah, that's it, basically. <laughs> <clears throat>